now, only on KGRA Radio, this is the Starborn Connection. Hey, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another Starborn Connection radio show. We are here tonight live on KGRA, your connection to the entire multiverse. Uh, We have a very nice guest tonight, but first, what I want to do is say hello to Julia. How are you doing? Doing great. Hello, everybody. And our uh, producer, Bill Skywatcher. How are you doing, Bill? Good evening, Michael and Julia. How are you tonight? Uh, breathing. We're doing good. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to say hi to everybody across the United States and around the world and out there in the different levels of awareness. How are you tonight? Anyway, uh, before we get started, remember, uh, Julia, I said last week I'd try to uh, interpret some of Ilona Podraska's uh, uh, alien friend's message. So, oh, yes. um, yeah, I, I did start and I, I have a little bit done. I'm going to read it. Um, and I tried to make the best sense out of it because this guy, um, this alien talks kind of like in chunks. So um, this is an April 2017 communication from uh, from Oli to uh, Ivanka uh, Podraska, which is Ilona's sister. Ivana. No, I don't want, I don't want Ivana, right. Uh, anyway, um, once again, our greeting was announced. He always starts with Alleluia and oh, oh, after that. Alleluia, oh, I guess. I don't know. He welcomes us here again. I welcome you here again. Oli talks about the fact, and this is interesting, that the oxygen in our atmosphere here on Earth is somewhat lower than normal. But Oli says today, we have done it for you. And I'm assuming, based on the context he presents it in, and I wish I could share the whole thing, but it's just too confusing, even for me. Uh, in the context, he is telling us they are monitoring it. Ollie then speaks about a feral animal they worked on genetically. He says it's a mutant very far from us on the evolutionary scale. And the structure of this animal is supposedly the basis for many of our prehistoric animals. He alludes to the fact that uh, this animal was located in the sandy rock and soil beneath the stones in Madagascar. They found it uh, shriveled, dried, and parched. And Oli tells us that they studied this creature in detail, but they did not have anything to do with the creation of this animal. Then he brings up the subject of mutation and the fact that mutation arose far before human civilization. And, And we really honestly don't know how far back human civilization goes. Current studies say maybe it's, uh, uh, you know, four million years since, um, you know, the first upright uh, ape walked the ground. But uh, they've been finding a lot of things that that kind of indicate that somebody, some group, was so much older, several million years. uh, I think they've got some artifacts that are – 20, 25, 30 million years old. So we're really not sure how how far uh, human civilization goes back. Now, he says that people are not done with the process of mutation and that they are still in the process of mutation. He then talks about the creature they found once more, that they have no connection to this creature and they could not take it back to the ship. They did sample the creature using lasers to cut samples. Now that is fascinating because with that in mind, remember the animal mutilations we learned about. Does anyone remember Snippy the horse? Uh, 
Yes. The first, you know, mm-hmm. first animal that was found that had uh, looked like laser surgical cuts, removing the various organ systems and uh, eyeballs and stuff like that. So that's fascinating. They use lasers to take samples. Now, Oli says that we humans would never have found this creature. They, on the other hand, have the technology to find these creatures uh, deep in the ground. In analyzing the creature, they feared that they would be contaminated by it. They were not sure of what the effects might be from prolonged exposures, which is the reason why they didn't bring it onto their ship. And I, I wish I could ask them why. Next week, anyway, now I'm working on uh, stuff that will talk about Area 51, Dolce, Dolce and Super Soldiers. So uh, that look forward to. That will be uh, pretty exciting. So anyway, what do you think, Julia? Oh, good stuff. Good Crazy stuff, stuff man. I'll yeah. tell you, if this guy is for real, uh, it's pretty cool. Jennifer, you know, I, I am in contact with this woman from Czechoslovakia, and and uh, her sister and her connect with this alien named Oli. And whenever I get a uh, message from her, I try to broadcast it. I try to interpret it and then broadcast it because I think, you know, it's pretty interesting, and some of it's pretty important. So just wanted to let you know that. Fascinating. All right, let's get on with the show now. Tonight, I, I, I kind of leaked who we have on tonight. Jennifer Stein is a self-taught filmmaker who did not go to film school. She is an entrepreneur who started making films in the 90s while running nonprofit organizations, raising her two children, and running a special events business in Philadelphia. Now, if that's not busy, I don't know what is. Jennifer thinks that harnessing the power of the moving visual image to educate, inspire, and empower is an important tool today in the world that we live in. Jennifer's most recent film in 2016 is Travis Walton, The True Story. It's a multi-award winning documentary about the 40-year history associated with the Travis Walton abduction case from 1975. I have a copy of the 2015 version, and I love it. It's just a wonderful, wonderful film, and and you get to see uh, the story in a completely different light, away from Hollywood, away from anything uh, that colors it any other way but the truthful. Uh, The film, the original film, was three years in the making, and all living members of the original logging crew were were featured. Current and archived interviews are woven together of the police sheriff, the chief polygraph expert for Arizona in 1975, as well as UFO experts Stan Friedman, Kathy Martin, Ben Hansen, James Fox, Peter Robbins, and Lee Spiegel. The true story has never been told in a documentary, and Jennifer believed the time had come to capture these interviews and testimonies on film for the next generation. Now, if you need more information about the film, or I think uh, if you want to get a copy, you want to go to TravisWaltonTheMovie.com. Very simple, TravisWaltonTheMovie.com. Jennifer's film website is onwingsproductions.com, and that's O-N-W-I-N-G-E-S productions.com, and it provides an overview of some of her past film productions. I, I, uh, I insist you guys check it out. Jennifer is also the founder of Mainline MUFON, a chapter of MUFON PA, which focuses on community outreach and education with monthly speakers and films. Started in 2002, the group creates awareness of the UFO phenomena, ancient archaeology, and other topics of interest, including health and wellness, consciousness, life after death, and more. Now, for more information, you can go to www.mainlinemufon.com. Celebrating 15 years of community outreach in the mainline area, the northwestern suburbs of Pennsylvania. Jennifer holds a BA in science from the University of Arizona in Tucson, and she is married with two adult daughters who are her greatest teachers, along with her husband, Michael. Jennifer, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. What a what a lovely introduction. That was uh, that was very kind. 
Well, I think I think people need to know what you do and how busy you are and the contributions you make to the field. So, you know, it it, it is tremendous. Well, it's it's wonderful to uh, to find your niche and to uh, I, I just learned so much doing this stuff. Um, it's so fascinating for me. Every time I take on a project, I, you know, uh, my mind gets blown in a new area, and it's um, it's wonderful. And nobody I know. tells you that when you're in college or high school that you know learning actually gets better as you get older, but it's really true. It really, it really does get better. I, I, I agree with you so much, because now I want to know a lot of things that I didn't know before. Before you know, it's my time to fly off somewhere. Uh, <laughs> but, yes, well, I one, don't know. one way or the other, right? Exactly. Where do you want to get started? There's so much we need to talk about. What do you think would be a good uh, place to start? Well, I really want people who are living in the Northeast Corridor to, to really know about what's happening uh, in two weeks up in Pine Bush. Okay. I think it's pretty important. Um, you know, the Pine Bush area historically had a long series of UFO uh, ex- experiencers. There's actually what's considered a UFO flap, which I think goes from the late 60s right through to the mid 90s, where there were constant series of sightings. And as a result, enough people have had enough sightings that the whole town of Pine Bush gets behind having a UFO fair and festival. It's sort of similar to what goes on in Roswell, you know, a very famous, you know, UFO story out of that uh, small community. Uh, Pine Bush is not unlike that. So it's a little hamlet of a town, a very small downtown area. They shut the whole main street down. They have a UFO parade. And this year, they're kind of doing a whole weekend. And the weekend's going to start off with a screening of of uh, the newest version of the Travis film. Excellent. Which the, the 2016 version, we're calling it. It's um, uh, it's called the Director's Cut. It's a little shorter than the original. It's a little more tightly edited, and it has some new interviews in it um, with, with different experts, uh, along with some of the original people. Um, it's just a slightly better film, and this, that's the one we're trying to sell to a network. So we're having a uh, like a screening of that at Friday night at 7 p.m. at the hotel where most of the speakers are staying. It's called the Home to Suites Hotel by Hilton. But if anybody wants to know about the Pine Bush event, they can go to um, you know Pine Bush UFO Fair. Just Google that, and they'll get to a main website, and they can see the whole schedule of events. So I'm very excited to be up there and be part of that event. They'll also be a um, a speaker's tent during the day where a number of locals will be talking about their own experiences, what they saw in Pine Bush. So it's, you know, community members talking to other community members, which I think is great. And then that afternoon, starting in late in the afternoon from five to nine at uh, the Catholic War Veterans Hall, which is right downtown, there's a little mini conference and there'll be four speakers. We'll have Mark D'Antonio, Peter Robbins, a fabulous gal uh, making her, her her premier debut in the United States. Her name is Kate Thorvinson and she's from Norway. Uh, she's going to talk about implants and a explain what her life experience has been discovering her own and then of course Travis Walton will be there so um and Travis will be present on Friday night when we screen the film for Q&A as well after the film so it really should be a great weekend so that's like a fabulous thing in that side of New York you know Pine Bush is maybe an hour and a half outside of New York City Mm -hmm. But if you live further west in the state of New York, in the town of Ithaca, which is about three hours further west, on um, on Sunday night, May twenty first, at at a theater there, which is basically an art house theater. It's really a uh, very historic theater right in downtown Ithaca. They are actually also screening the film Travis, and we will go there for a Q and A. Uh, on Sunday night after that film. So you could see Travis on either side of the state in New York, depending on where you live. Um, And that's really wonderful. And then, of course, if you live in Philadelphia, he will be actually giving his PowerPoint here in Philadelphia. Oh, nice. uh, For the Mainline MUFON group on Tuesday night, the 23rd. So it's uh, if you're living on the Northeast Corridor somewhere, it's a great opportunity to get to see Travis if you never have. 
I might go there myself. I haven't seen him in a oh, yeah. year, year and a half. Well, we, we'd love to see you. It's uh, For that information, it's MainlineMufon.com, and he's the speaker. And, of course, it's right in almost in downtown Wayne, not quite. It's in the town of, of Stratford, and it's at the public library, and it's free. So get there early because we will be packed. We'll probably oh, shut God, down yeah. the parking lot <laughs> like we did Oof. before. Yeah, you will be busy. Uh, Travis for free, people listening. That's right. that you don't run into that every day, really. No, you, you know, <laughs> you don't. and it's really I, I'm a I'm in a very unique and very blessed position because, of course, I'm involved in the Pine Bush screening. I asked him to come to Philly, and he agreed. And I'm hosting him, and um, I generally don't charge for my programs. Um, and it's really kind of a nice little find on the main line. A lot of You're people. You're not kidding. It's uh, it's one of the best kept secrets. We don't advertise really. Uh, we do a little bit of public announcements, but it's really people who uh, want to get together and discuss this stuff, which we do. We often go out to Manila's diner and stay there and talk till one or two in the morning. The diner's open all night, <laughs> so there's no problem. So for the night owls who want to continue to talk and uh, and you know share stories and learn from one another and share books and information. Uh, that's where some of the greatest uh, learning experiences take place is after the programs when we all go out together. And I, ha- I have to uh, give Manila's uh, Diner a little bit of a of a sell there. The, the, if you're hungry, let me tell you, this place is the place to go. They they give you platters that are so big. I at 320 pounds have to take some home. So you know, <laughs> they're really good. Yes, they're they're fabulous. They're wonderful, and they take very good care of us too. Like uh, they hug and kiss us when we come in. Like, <laughs> well, the fun people are here, so it's very it's very funny. Well, anyway, we're on the subject of of the uh, the Travis Walton film. Uh, when when you first had the idea, what made you think that it was real important to get this film made? Well, you know, the, as you know, Michael, the um, UFO phenomenon continues to. Uh, you know, happen. It, it, it's never gone away. We may hear about it more or less in different decades, but Travis's story is really a profound and a unique case mm-hmm. in that it's not just one man's testimony. There were seven loggers, Travis being one of them. Uh, you know, Travis jumped out of the truck and ran right under this craft that he saw in a forest because he wanted to get a really good look at it. Um you know, what happens to him, all the other men witnessing it, the 500 people looking for him. It's not one of those stories that really can get swept under the rug. Obviously, it it became a Paramount film in 1993, but unfortunately, Paramount producers felt they had to distort the real reality of the story. And the real truth to the story, I think, is an eye-opener for the advancement of, of human evolution and human consciousness on the whole UFO topic. So I felt, I really felt that the true story needed to be told because the younger generations are getting their, their history and their information in sound bites and in YouTube videos. They're not reading books. They don't often know the real history of, of events. And I felt that putting the history of the Travis case into a documentary was important for people who aren't reading anymore and who are just, you know, maybe watching documentaries to kind of understand their history. I felt a true history needed to be done. And, and one that really dealt with the 40 year history, not just the the 20 year history, which is what um, to a certain extent, the Paramount picture film did Mm -hmm. because you know what, the more, you know, about the story, the more you learn that all these boys you know, would have wished it never happened. And if they had gone back to change their life in some way, they certainly would have. But of course, they can't undo it. So they have to, as Travis says, accept the good with the bad, face the reality of this and learn from it. And then they have to be brave enough to continue to go out there and stick to their true story and Mm -hmm. tell for 40 years. And as you begin to really climb inside their own psyches, which you get the opportunity to do through this film. Um, You know, it just, I I think for other people who are experiencers or who have abduction experience, it gives them uh, 
a sense of, uh, you know, maybe validity to their own experience, or it gives them a sense of courage to continue to speak their own truth and to not have somebody tell them they don't know what they're talking about, or they Mm. can't rely on their own senses, or, you know, they don't know what happened. You know, there, there is, there are certain things we don't know, but what we do know, we should honor and protect and not let somebody take away from us. And those were all parts of the, the important building blocks that went into my motivation to make this film. Mm. Uh, yeah, you know, and you're right too, because um, I don't know, Julia, maybe, or Bill, you might know, I, I, I don't think there's any uh, UFO story that matches the detail that, you know, uh, Betty and Barney Hill, Travis Walton, um, you know, the past. I think it's one of the biggest ones, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, we don't, you don't hear about them anymore. Yeah. You know something? Definitely the the, the Pascagoula case and also, uh, what was the case uh, up in the... um, Oh, the Allagash? The Allagash story. Right, right. You know what? When I saw the movie last year, uh, Jennifer had a, uh, they did this in Manhattan last year. When I saw that there at the the Dick Festival and yes. the Philip K. Dick. Yeah, I think it was Philip K. Dick Festival. Yeah. And what I what I took from this was you, we all know of the the fire in the sky, the Hollywood version mm, yeah. which, where they stretch things. You know, they take it to just to make give it that Hollywood appeal and to see this documentary and to see things in the context of being a documentary where the facts are portrayed, the testimony is there, and you're able to to see that there. And what I was wondering was the difficulty that Jennifer, uh, if you had any, Jennifer, of getting mm-hmm. all the parties involved, like the logging crew and family members or the people as far as law enforcement, uh, just how difficult was it to get everybody you know, mm, to participate yeah. in that? Well, that, that's why it took me three years to make yeah. this film. It wasn't easy. Uh, just to get all of the logging crew to want to get back together again. Mm. Um, you know, to a certain extent, this did cause some problems between those guys. I mean, they're they're all in their 60s and early 70s now, so uh, they, they got over it. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yes, getting the law enforcement to be willing to cooperate took me a year and a half to uh, <laughs> wow. get to... Uh, uh, Marlon Gillespie, who was the uh, police chief at the time, um, the head of the investigation, to agree to work with me. Um, I didn't know where and how to find Cy Gilson. And, you know, one contact always leads to another. So Marlon and Cy Gilson have exchanged, you know, holiday cards for years. And they one lived in, in Heber and the other lived in Tucson. So once I knew where he lived, I just hopped in the car and drove to Tucson and knocked on his door you know, basically in order to get him to, uh, to participate. So, um, and it's really, I'm really glad I did because Marlon has now passed away. Um, so, mm. you know, uh, and uh, not, two of the crew have also passed away. Oh, I wasn't wow. able to interview them, but, but two of the crew died before I even started the project. So um, it, it's tricky. And I don't know if you can tell, probably not by the way it's edited, but I did post the full interview of Marlon on 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 the uh, Travis Walton, the movie dot com website, because I thought his interview unedited was very telling because it's still. But when you listen to it, you can still realize that I'm not 100 percent sure that Marlon completely believed these boys. Mm. He would answer things in very um, measured ways. He would say, well, the boys really believed they were telling the truth. And we just kept saying to the press, well, we're trying to investigate and really, we really don't know what happened. You know, so there were there were many times where I was expecting to get more in-depth factual information from Marlon. And I'd have to ask him a question six different times before... Wow. He'd like maybe give me a, a, a like another half an inch, <laughs> but when Boy. I turned off the camera, when I turned off the camera, he told me about two of his own UFO experiences, which were wow. stunning, <laughs> just like shocking. And I was like, "Wow, why didn't you tell me that when I had the camera on?" And he said, "Well, because <laughs> you know people know me in this town." Yeah. So uh, there's still a lot of resistance to talk about this I, issue. I got one more question. I got one. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go ahead. I'm hearing an echo, but um, 
what about Travis's participation? Because for a time, he seemed that he didn't. He was, you know, withdrawn. He didn't want the attention. He didn't want to get involved with all this because he did go through a lot of emotional, yeah, mental, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tra- you could say traumatic for him. You know, everything that happened to him, all the negative publicity that people were putting out there. Et well, I think it took him years to process it too. Yes, yeah, so- yeah, he well- just started changing the, yeah. the past few years, getting you know, getting. Over a lot. Right. So what, how was that to engage with him, uh, Jennifer? It seemed that the timing was just right, that right. it all came together to make this possible. Well, I think by the time I met Travis, which was really in 2010, I may have met him once or twice before that, where he, he came actually to some Philly MUFON conferences that I helped to coordinate. So I introduced him, you know, maybe I had dinner with him, but we really didn't talk. Uh, when I got to know him better, it was through Peter Robbins. I had gone mm-hmm. out to be an assistant at uh, one of the Roswell conferences with Peter, who uh, was a consultant to the city of Roswell to help run their Roswell conferences for years. And Peter and I became close, he realized that I was a former event planner. He said, man, you know, will you come to run <laughs> right. and help you run those events? And I said, of course, it would be an honor. So over a bottle of wine at a little restaurant called Peppers, for anybody who's been to Roswell, we started to talk to Travis about the fact that his story was no less important than the Roswell story. And, you know, Roswell has up, upwards of, you know, at, at certain years, they've had over 10,000 people. Oh, yeah. Over that city for that anniversary conference. So talk about an economic boom to the community. Once the business people got behind it in Roswell, it changed the whole scene. And that's what's happening in Pine Bush. That's what's happening in McMinnville. There's a lot of places which have even Kecksburg, you know, that have a historic UFO sightings and Exeter, uh, I think right. Exeter, Vermont or New Hampshire. So we said to Travis, hey, you know, why not Snowflake, Arizona? Why not an annual conference? It's now 35 years. In 2010, it was the 35th, you know, anniversary, November 5th. We said to him, why don't you start to think about a conference? And I offered my services to sort of be a coach. I didn't live in Arizona, of course. I lived in Philadelphia, but I had some conference experience, some event experience. I said, as you lead up to an anniversary, like the 37th, 38th, 39th, you know, eventually you're going to have a 40th. That'll be in five years. Let's start planning that now. Let's, you know, would you you be interested? And he said, yeah, probably. So that's how I started working with Travis. And in the process, we realized that one of his goals, he actually wanted to take people into the forest at night on the anniversary of the abduction experience and let people experience. Wow. Yeah. Experience. Now, as an event coordinator, I'm thinking insurance and practicality and, you know, people with canes and, you know, people needing a bathroom and the bears and the coyotes and, you know, the wild boars that are up there. And I'm thinking danger, danger, danger. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a half hour from the nearest road. There are no lights. And I'm thinking, well, Travis, maybe I could talk you into a plan B. <laughs> maybe <laughs> we could do a film where we take people into the forest. And then we, in the comfort of, a, of an air-conditioned safe hotel, we can turn down the lights and take people there in a virtual way. This, this was my original thinking. Because, you know, in November, it can snow. You can have a downpour. It can oh, rain. Yeah. You can have, you know, a tornado. I mean, it's like all sorts of stuff can happen. And you're 45 minutes from the nearest town and there's no hospital there, as you learn in the film, as you start to hear Travis recount his story. So I made uh, a film with Bob Terrio. Actually, I give Bob like, you know, almost 100 percent credit for the first film project we did and this is called tracking sky fire and this was to be a plan b associated with a conference in case it snowed or uh, you know the bus got stuck in the mud or something or we couldn't (laughs) get up to the site we'd have a film 
And we would bring the boys who were in the crew together back to the forest. We would walk them through the forest, talk to them, film it, and kind of get the feeling and their experience on camera. And once I produced that piece with Bob Terrio uh, called Tracking Sky Fire, uh, I thought, you know what? I could push this film just a little further. I was getting ready to plan the 2014 conference for MUFON in Philly, where I had Lee Spiegel speaking, and we had Jan Harzine, who was going to be there, and Ben Hansen, and Kathy Martin, and Stanton Friedman was supposed to be there. And I had, you know, many key people that I could speak to about Travis's case that would be very relevant. Yeah. And I had a great contribution to a documentary. So that's what I did. I took over a couple of hotel rooms, brought in my lights and cameras and set up a screening schedule. And behind the scenes of that 2014 MUFON conference, we shot for four days straight in, a, in our hotel rooms. So, and, so that, that had been in production for a couple of years, actually, then. Yeah. Yes. At that point, it had already been in production about two years. And then that mm. was year three. Then I went back and got Marlon Gillespie in 2014 in the summer. And, and Cy Gilson and a couple of other people. Uh, and then, of course, in 2015, uh, I started working on the revised edition and I started interviewing David Jacobs and uh, other people. I, um, you know, I got, uh, uh, oh, I'm blanking on his name, psychologist from Wyoming. Um, oh, geez. Um, yeah. Can't uh, think. <laughs> it's, it's all right. It'll come to me. It's just a nice little yeah. senior moment. Um, Leo, Leo, Leo Sprinkle. Yes, Leo. Um, and wow. I got a different polygraph expert from Philadelphia who was the head, current head of the uh, International Polygraph Association to speak about 40 years of polygraph history now, looking back at this case and why and how it was significant. So really, you know, when you think about it, it was almost the newest film. It's about four and a half, almost five years in the making. Wow, beautiful. How is it being received? How, how are what are what are some of the things people are saying about it? Well, I'm you know stunned because most often films like this don't get accepted into mainstream film festivals. Uh usually the just the whole UFO topic to begin with, they it gets, you know, uh, disqualified almost immediately. But this film has screened in over like 27, to, well, no, yeah, more than that. It's screened in about 28 film festivals that have accepted it. And it's won a number of, of mm. additional awards. I mean, when you get accepted, you get laurels, which means you can post it on your website that your film screened in this film festival. But then in addition to that, people vote on the films when they come to the film festivals. So we've won like, um, you know, a number of additional awards, like six or seven, you know, best picture, best documentary, um, best uh, true story, you know, all sorts of things. Yeah, that is absolutely amazing. That's great. Isn't it? That's great. Jennifer. Yeah, so I'm very excited about that. Well, Jennifer, has the movie been released in in foreign uh, countries and with co with captions in those languages yet? No, oh, right. Not yet. Uh, that's that would be the job of a distributor, and I'm hoping that a, a distributor will will decide to pick it up and then work with me on that. That's another whole investment in the film, mm -hmm. you know. But I do, I've set it up well, um, so I have the. The scripted text, it's just a matter of translating it and putting it at the, you know, in closed captions at the bottom of a screen and reformatting the film. You know, I'm not a language specialist, so I don't think I would take that on. But that's that's a role of a distributor. Once yeah. once he agrees to market it, say, in the United States and Canada and Mexico, then he would do South America or Europe and take it into other languages. And then it's a pretty formulaic process from there. But it's getting your foot in the door at a distributor. That's that's not something within my power <laughs> to do. I can I can submit it to film festivals. Like the traction it's had has been because I've been behind it, pushing it like a large snowball. You know, right? And it continues oh. to attract attention and snow, but. Um, getting it to the next step really re requires uh, people to start paying attention, and that has a lot to do with your listeners. Mm -hmm. Once the film gets a, a you know over whatever you know uh, like 
50,000 to 100,000 hits in its YouTube trailer or more, or even close to a half a million, you know, that which would be wonderful. If it gets that kind of traction, then it gets attention. And that, that really has to do with who's paying attention to where it's screening and things like that. So uh, some of it's out of my control. Now, if somebody, uh, if somebody on the internet sees that and is interested in purchasing a copy, how do they go about that? Well, you can right now. I I do sell DVDs of the first, uh, uh, the original uh, film, which um, they just you go to TravisWaltonTheMovie.com and bingo presto, there's an option to buy go. the DVD right away. That's really the <clears throat> only way they can see this film, unless they come to a conference or a screening where it's showing. Um, I don't. I did not want to put it up on a pay per view because that um, uh, the newest version, although it's maybe twenty five, thirty five percent different, it still has a lot of the original footage in it. But right. there's a lot of additional footage, and it's more tightly edited, and the music is a little different. So it's basically the same film, but a better version of the same film. Um, and I know it's a it's a good film because it's been bootlegged over sixty times. Honey. Oh my God! Really? And I have to take it down. <laughs> That, yeah, that fine. that's a sign of a good film. That really you know, is. You know, you're doing something right when people try to steal it. So. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a like I said, it's a big snowball, and I have to keep. You know, sometimes it rolls a little to the right, and I gotta roll it back to the left, and you know, it's 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 a job. Well, I've I've personally own a copy, and I've seen the film, and I think um, people out there in the audience, if you haven't seen it, go to the website. Get a copy. It's wonderful. It really is. It really tells you the real story and not the Hollywood story of Travis Walton. And I, I was very lucky to actually get a number of people to um, to look at it early on. In fact, um, I've, I, I was a, a long-term friend with Edgar Mitchell. And mm -hmm. I was in Florida prior to uh, the film coming out, and I gave him a copy. And he called me and said, Jen, I want to offer you an endorsement. Um, you know, I had asked him if he'd be willing to. You know, I asked him if he'd look at it and if he would consider an endorsement. I said it would mean the world to me. But I never expected it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, th those are sorts of things everybody gets asked to endorse other people's stuff. But he gave me one, and I was so touched. I said, Edgar, can I put this on the cover of the DVD? And he said, I would be really honored. So um, if you go to the website, I do have a page where anybody can write an endorsement about the film. Um, you can just you know, send in, a, send in a comment. You can email me, or you can uh, post it on the Facebook page to TravisWaltonTheMovie.com, and I may follow up with you and say, can I post it on the website? But I also had Paul Hellier look at it. You know, um, and, of course, I sent it to Stanton and to Rich Dolan and to Peter Robbins and to Ben Hansen, and I got their feedback on it as well prior to actually releasing it. And most of them said, I wouldn't change a thing, Jen. You know, like, you you nailed it. You almost nailed it to the point where <laughs> you know, people, like, some people can't even follow it because it's a very hardcore factual information mm -hmm. especially about an hour into it like we really we open the door on debunking like no other documentary i think has done and i think unless people have a background in how effective and um uh d like you know damaging uh, debunking can be and unless you've experienced it, like Travis and the crew members have, you don't really understand what mm, it's right. And especially their story that was so out there. Um, you know, this one debunker named Philip Class and never wanted to give up on the story. I mean, he chased this story for almost 25 years. Oh, God, yeah. So he I really opened the window on that. And um, the, I've gotten a lot of comments from people in the UFO field that have said, Jen, you know, not only did, is the film good and does it really, you know, pay tribute to Travis, but you open a window here that a lot of other people uh, haven't ever really wanted to touch with a 10 foot pole mm, right. in film or in books. So. Well, I think it's, I think I'm going to add my endorsement to it. <laughs> no, I'd be thrilled. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, no problem at all. Uh, I just think it's really from. good. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and I'll add mine. I saw absolutely. it at the conference. 
Yeah. It was fabulous. Yes. Yeah. Well, Thank I'll tell you. you. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. It okay. was me. It was me interrupting, saying ah. thank. You no problem. What, you know, what's, you know, I, I, I what I want to. Yeah, do you have another question, Bill? No, I was going to say. You know what's great when you go to these movie uh, premieres uh, of the documentary, and you have the opportunity to engage with the panel. Oh, Travis, yeah. Peter, Jennifer, the um, just all the people that were involved, and to just be up close and personal like that, and to have that exchange <laughs> makes it even special when you go and attend you know these movie showings like what's going to happen in pine bush in a couple of weeks and um at one point travis actually was doing when it was shown in manhattan travis was there via skype or it was something with jennifer do you remember yeah. i think it was skype or... yes it was via skype we were trying to get him up on the big screen but it just didn't work so. yeah mm-hmm. but to have him there in person and you know again pine bush has that personal attraction to this because like uh, jennifer was mentioning this area had a lot of sightings, a lot of activity. It was known as the hotspot. The Hudson Valley was known as the hotspot for decades. So yeah, I, oh I, yeah. I know a lot of these people that are that are still residing in Pine Bush, the locals especially, they're gonna love having the opportunity to have Travis there and to engage with him. Uh, because they can relate to this on a personal level because there's been a lot of people here that are experiences ex- as well and they they feel that connection there so well, that's 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 a very good point and the conference itself is probably only going to have maybe a hundred people there mm-hmm. maybe 100 oh, wow. mm-hmm. it's not like a thousand when right. you go to contact in the desert mm-hmm. or you go to international ufo congress you know you're one of a thousand people in the audience yeah. this is a this is a much different type of uh environment it's much um, more intimate yeah and of course there'll be book signings and dvd signs <laughs> and poster signings and stuff like that so if you want to pick up any memorabilia that really helps the speaker because because really, Travis is is not really being paid very much at all to come to this conference, but he's doing it because of the opportunity to really connect with people, and he knows the importance of the Pine Bush area. Well, you know, the the uh, I was turned on to the Hudson Valley flap uh, actually through Whitley Strieber's book Communion. That's the first time I really uh, oh Hudson Valley, wow, this is where he was. Mm-hmm. You know, he had experienced all that stuff. So, yeah, and that is a very important area. Yes. Yeah. In fact, um, Bill is going to be doing some night watches. Uh, yes. In his region. He's a little closer to the uh, the Hudson uh, uh, than really where Pine Bush is, but um, uh, not not far. You know, to a half, half hour, hour forty mm-hmm. minutes. Mm-hmm. But still, that's wonderful. Uh, like I spoke about this in the past. I've I've spoken with a local police officer. He's now retired. He was the lieutenant. And he told me personally, off the record, I wish he would have went on the record, but they, you know how the <laughs> offices are. They won't go on the record. Yeah, anymore. right. He said that he, he knows of retired police officers that have had sightings. Even in one case, they saw a, uh, an object go in the Hudson River and out. Oh, man. Yeah. Wow. So this does, you know, there are a lot of people. And I got to say also, Jennifer last year, did one of the most amazing presentations of crop circles. I, I, I was floored, and everybody that was with me and everybody that was in the audience, they were totally, because I'll be honest, there's a lot of people that are on the fence, you know, as, or speculative about crop circles, but when I saw her presentation, oh, yeah. Oh, it was amazing. Yeah. My Bill, you and I, I, I don't know, you and I must be pretty much in sync because I was just about ready to say, let's put Travis to bed for a while because there's so much else, you know, <laughs> that, that this uh, unbelievable lady has done. And, you know, uh, yeah, uh, Jennifer, you you work, you are a crop circle researcher. Tell us about that. That's fascinating. Yeah. In fact, when Bill called me tonight, I was watching a YouTube video <laughs> from a man by the name of Donald Scott talking about Burkle and Currents and how uh, the American, uh, you know, physicists and and space scientists are now starting to understand the electrical nature to the universe. So, uh, yeah, I've been I've been studying plasmas like in depth for the last year um, because. Uh, you know, crop circles have led me there trying to understand what's going on in them. There's so much uh, physical trace evidence in crop circles. I think that's 
mostly why uh, of all the things that you can study in this field, I've been most attracted to that. And when I present, I really present just a lot of factual evidence. Mm -hmm. I don't try to convince people of any one particular causation, but I show them the facts and the evidence on the ground and on the crops and in the soil and in the slides and in the seed germination studies. And I show them the charts and the graphs mm -hmm. and say, you make up your mind, but something is definitely going on no, here. Absolutely. Jennifer, that's, one, that's one area that I really have not paid a whole lot of attention to but have always been fascinated by you know i really i really need an education on crop circles uh you know i've, I've read some stuff but boy there sure is a lot to learn there jennifer yeah and, and yeah go, go i'm go sorry ahead, Bill. i didn't mean to interrupt but I, I know that a few years ago i'm wondering if this is where this the inception began with you and your interest in crop circles because i know you did something a few years ago with uh chet and Callista snow which you did a 20 minute documentary film and I think this was in the English countryside. And you also did a crop circle conference there. You attended it, right? Yes, yes, I did. In fact, I've I uh, I spent a number of years going to England um, and spending time in the Wilshire area, which is uh, you know a, a central area where a lot of crop circles are happen. It's sort of between the the far uh, eastern coast and you know the, the central countryside. Uh, just uh, east of London, and um, I I did travel with Chet and Kalista Snow, and I made a little uh, documentary for them. Which that's one of the freebie films that's up on uh, On Wings Productions. So people who are interested in going to watch that can go to On Wings Productions and and see it. I think it's called uh, A Journey with Chet and Kalista, or uh, Traveling with Chet and Kalista Snow, something like that. Um, that sounds good. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of like what you experience when you go to England, and this is the way you kind of learn about crop circles going into them. And I interviewed a bunch of people who were on the trip there, but I I made several trips back and forth. I've even spoken in England um, on crop circles as well. So, uh, but I've been in them in Canada and in the United States. They continue to happen really kind of all over the world, and they're not happening only in crops. We're we're finding right, right. Uh, and, and it's not only the pretty geometries that I'm trampsing through. I go in a lot of randomly downed crop, which anyone can see a lot of if they bother to pay attention to it. It's usually after a heavy rainstorm, like we've had the last two days here in Pennsylvania. You can be driving alongside of a, you know, a, a farm field. There aren't a lot of big crops up here yet, but you can be driving along and suddenly see massive amounts of crop that are just laid down in what doesn't look like a pattern at all. It looks just like a random flow, like there was a flood or like a river went through there. Right. And in fact, a river really did, but not one that you can see. Probably some sort of electromagnetic river went Damn. through. Some, yeah, kind that's what, that's, plasma, that's... some kind of plasma charge or something that is electrifying that crop and creating a static field that heats up the crop and and makes the the stem of the crop bend over now that that's that's uh you were talking about plasma earlier and i was going to ask you what what the uh, the current thinking is on on crop circles um the 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 does is it related at all with with a uh, ball lightning phenomenon or anything like that well, yes, it's all related to the extent that electrical charges are all related to each other. Uh, you know, it, it's all about how electrical current flows and uh, what are the known physical facts about electrical currents. So um, I can recommend uh, people who are interested in this topic to start to get a, a background and to go out and Google and, and read articles on on, on plasma and plasma physics because uh, there's a lot happening in our understanding of the nature of not only our earth, our earth sciences, but our space sciences as well. Mm -hmm. We still really do not know, and you may think I'm jumping off the topic, but in actuality, I'm trying to hit it on the head with a hammer for you. <laughs> Um, we still don't really know what makes up dark energy and dark matter. Right, but we right. provided like 
the known universe, you know, and I think it's something like 94% of it is made up of either dark matter or dark energy, right? I think 76% is dark energy and uh, another 20, like 4% or something is dark matter. Well, really, what is that? We don't really know what that is. And I've, I've heard that uh, dark matter might be the framework that holds things together in the exactly. universe. Exactly. Yes. And what we're now discovering, and I'll tell you that the electric universe theorists have known this for really 40, 50, maybe 60 years. One of the earliest electric universe theorists, although he didn't know he was one, was Emmanuel Velikovsky. Oh, uh, a Russian uh, physicist. He wrote Worlds in Collision and a, a number of other uh, books. Uh, he was a uh, stimulated a lot of great thinking on the planet. Uh, of course, uh, I first learned about him through Zachariah Sitchin, and that's a whole nother topic. Yeah. But he believed there were electrical discharges that may have occurred in the past that created instabilities and that maybe our sun was not as stable as we thought it was. And maybe the whole story of Genesis in the Bible is really a story that deals with cosmological events that took place in the ancient past, which we can see remnants of, like the asteroid belt is probably a planet that exploded mm -hmm. between Mars and Jupiter. So when you start to look at the bigger picture, uh, when you start to look at, well, it's only in 19, I think 1970, or no, 1998, we finally accepted the dark matter, dark energy theory. But there were uh, predictors that led up to the acceptance of that theory. Uh, in fact, one of them was a, was an amazing Vassar student. I love it because my daughter went to Vassar. This, this gal named Vera Rudin was trying to measure redshift. And uh, I think she worked for a national agency. Um, I forget the name of it, but it was, uh, you know, some national observatory uh, trying to understand uh, distance between stars and how mm -hmm. light and she said, there are miscalculations in our observations that just don't make sense. She said, wow. there's something else there. And really, it's electrical fields which can distort and change the way and speed with which light moves. And now, more and more, scientists are beginning to accept this. In fact, I was just reading about something called Swarm, which has some journal. It's got, you know, it's a series of alphabets to it, S-W-A-R-M. I don't really know what it stands for, so I have to look mm. it up uh, uh, tonight. But uh, Swarm is like a scientific journal that just came out and admitted that there are electrical charges uh, in the universe that we haven't understood in the past. So, um, un you know, I know I'm jumping off the topic because I get so excited about this. But um, if you go and if anyone's interested and they're listening, if they look up the work of um, Kristen uh, Berkelin, he uh, was one of the first people to make predictions about the aurora borealis and the electrical nature of our atmosphere. There's huge electrical charges going on between the outer magnetosphere and the surface of our Earth. Um, we see a lot of things like lightning. You were mentioning earlier, ball lightning. Um, there's lightning that goes cloud to cloud. Mm -hmm. And really what that is, it's a series of charges traveling through uh, the space of our atmosphere, which makes up the ionosphere, the, uh, you know, there's various levels. First, there's the lowest level closest to the ground, then upper levels known as the ionosphere, then above that there's the magnetosphere, and then all those can be divided up into multiple names, stratosphere and whatnot. I won't bore people with different names, <laughs> but there are observed for many, many years by pilots what's called plasma sprites. Mm -hmm. These are like spiraling currents of charge that spiral around each other, and they go into these things that are considered to be jets or magnetic pinches, which shoot their power down to the surface, but it's like a microwave. You don't see it all as visible light. 
because it's in a wide range of fields, right. gamma rays, alpha rays, you know, microwaves, terahertz rays. We see some of it that's in the light spectrum, but the part that's not in the light spectrum, we don't see. Now, there are certain geological um, aspects to the geology of the earth that will attract certain mm -hmm. occurrence. You know, when you're swimming in a pond or a swimming pool and then you see thunder, the lifeguard says, get out of the pool. Well, the reason they tell you to get out of the pool is because water is conductive. Right, right. So water could attract a lightning bolt. And if a lightning bolt strikes the water, anything swimming in that water will be electrified. Now, there are large bodies of water underground. There are also uh, that electrical charges will travel through. Mm -hmm. There are also areas known and referred to as aquifers, natural aquifers, right, right. sand aquifers, right, or limestone aquifers. The reason they're aquifers is because the ground allows the water to penetrate or percolate through it. Like if you have a pile of rocks, people understand this just from doing their own, um, you know, water management <laughs> on their properties. Mm -hmm. You want to take the water away from your house once it comes out of your drain spout. You don't want it seeping down the side of the wall of your oh, basement and seeping in. So you do a trough or you do a, uh, you know, a... Um, a plastic barrier with a bunch of stones or rocks so that the water will hit that and travel further away from your house and dissipate out in your lawn. Well, it can do that underground as well. And if water is traveling through limestone, uh, it's going to set up a charge in the ground. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There are other things that set up charge in the ground as well, known as Schumann resonance, uh, you know, there's earth resonance, currents. There's also certain geologic structures, certain types of stones, which will carry current further and faster. Certain stones like granite and things like this will actually ring with current or sing. You've heard of the singing rock? Right, right. right? In Bucks County, you go up and hit them with a hammer, and really, they 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 ping. It's amazing. And they have we, different levels. So. We you know what I'm starting to think is that maybe, just maybe, these crop circles uh, might be caused by the natural kind of electrical flow of um, the earth, what's in the earth, what's above the earth, all of this kind of interacts for it. Bingo. Or is it or is it manipulated by, uh, you know, uh, aliens or somebody on a different level? Bingo just again. Yes, you are absolutely following the right train of thought, Michael. These are all the questions that an intelligent person starts to ask. Oh, well, thank you. Once <laughs> they start, well, you are. You're very bright. I mean, you know, most of your listeners are too, I'm sure. Yes, oh, absolutely. You know, what, once you start to look at the facts, you begin to realize that um, there are natural things that can be utilized to maybe – push these formations in one direction or another mm. just like electricity is natural we just learned how to harness it and push it through wires and we use it to light our house but it's a natural phenomenon that existed before humans were here so uh, possibly this whole plasma charge and plasma energies and electrical currents in the ground which have all existed like before we were here maybe that can be used or tweaked or changed in some way uh, and the more I study about plasmids, the stranger it gets because there's a lot of correlations between consciousness, mm. speed in which light travels, the speed in which consciousness travels, the fact that light can be a carrier of knowledge. Uh, they're talking about computer systems now that will move at the speed of light and be yeah. carried yeah. on light signals rather than on electrical signals. It, it you see, it's like a man. I jump into a rabbit hole, and I get so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Let's uh, let's uh, let's take our break now. Uh, but one thing I do want to say before we go to break, uh, perhaps in the near future they're going to find out that consciousness is a particle and a wave too, just like light is. <laughs> okay, we'll take a break, right? Okay, let's do it. Let's sell some stuff to keep this station on the air. 
We'll see you on the other side, folks. Some more exciting stuff coming. Uh, maybe some ancient alien stuff and uh, talking about some ancient sites. Uh, th- this lady has done just about it all. So we'll get back after this break. Okay, nurse, let's get this man to the ER, stat. Right away, doctor. We see this every day. Heart attack or angina pain due to blocked and clogged arteries. Chelation can remove obstructions or blockages from arteries and help avoid painful and expensive surgery. Now there's Angioprim. It's a liquid oral chelation product that you take with juice. You start to feel the results fast. Angioprim increases blood flow all over the body, and that means more energy and strength to take on the day with less aches and pains. 60 years of research has gone into chelation. And Angioprim is the result, a safe and easy way to unblock your veins and arteries from buildup that slow circulation. Paging Dr. Jones, please report to the emergency room right away. Log on now for a special radio offer from Angioprim. That's angioprim.com slash radio, A-N-G-I-O-P-R-I-M, angioprim.com slash radio, or call 877-882-7221. That's 877-882-7221. It's Thursday night, and you're grabbing drinks with some friends. Start it off with a pitcher for the table, which quickly becomes two. There's pool. And there's the photo booth. All right, everybody, squeeze in. Say cheese. Followed naturally by an order of wings. And another. Can we get some extra ranch sauce? Then there's the ceremonial nightcap. So what are we doing this weekend? And lastly, it's back to the car, which, if you're buzzed... ...could be the most expensive night of your life. Getting pulled over for buzz driving could cost you around $10,000 in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. Nothing kills a buzz like getting pulled over for buzz driving, because buzz driving is drunk driving. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. In 1947, something crashed in the desert outside of Roswell, New Mexico. Initial information released to the Roswell Daily Record by the Roswell Army Airfield saying that a flying disc had been found and was now in the possession of the Army. However, hours later, that story was changed, telling instead that it was simply a crashed weather balloon. Seven decades have resulted in conspiracy theories that the U.S. government has covered up the possibility that an alien spacecraft was responsible for the 1947 crash. This year, June 30th through July the 2nd, the Roswell Daily Record celebrates the 70th anniversary of this crash mystery with the Roswell Incident Conference 2017. See and hear Emmy Award-winning investigative journalist Linda Moulton Howe, the world's preeminent UFO historian Richard M. Dolan, remote viewing expert Dr. Courtney Brown, former head of the MOD's UFO project Nick Pope, the best UFO boots on the ground investigators in the world like Chase Pletsky, Chuck Zikowski, Debbie Zagelmeyer, and many more. The KGRA crew will be there live on location with interviews, hosting the speakers panel on Sunday, and the 2017 RDR KGRA Awards presentation. Tickets are on sale now. Seating is limited. Visit RoswellIncident.com. Come learn it all. From some of the best ufology has to offer, make plans and get your tickets now at RoswellIncident.com. You listen to us, and we listen to you. And so does the CIA. (laughs) KGRARadio.com. Welcome back, everyone. You are listening to the Starborn Connection radio show live. Every Saturday night from 10 to midnight on KGRA, Internet Radio, Alternative Talk, the only place on the net that connects you to the multiverse. So hang in there. We have a lot of really, really good shows on the station, including, of course, ours. Anyway, back to our guest tonight. Uh, Jennifer Stein, who uh, I read her bio earlier, just is one busy, brilliant and and uh, productive woman here on this planet and in this reality. And um, what I would like to 
talk about now is something that uh, one of the things that I love is on Friday nights to watch the new Ancient Aliens show. It's been it's in its twelfth season now, which is really amazing considering, you know, uh, you know all that they've been able to cover. Um, and you have been taking some trips to some of the uh, sites that uh, they feature on there, like Gobekli Le Tepe, uh, and uh, you've been uh, on a trip with uh, Robert Schock and his wife Katie. Uh, where did your interest uh, come from uh, when it comes to ancient sites and everything? Well, of course, um, it came when I stumbled across Zachariah Sitchin. Okay. Um, I started to read Sitchin's books. And I started to study the Sumerian history and hang out, of course, in the Metropolitan Museum in, in New York, which is amazing. I recommend people on the East Coast go check out the Near East exhibits there. It's, it rivals and is very comparable to what's in the Louvre and what's in the Pergamon as well in Germany. Uh, there's some of the t- and the, and um, yeah, the British Museum as well in in England and London. They're they're incredible. Uh, archives into ancient Assyria and uh, many like UFO questions come out of studying those ancient sites of course Eric Von Donegan brought a lot of this to uh, the mainstream as well Mm -hmm. uh, and was a contemporary writer of of Sitchin's they both started to publish 75 76 around the same time Um, so it was Zachariah Sitchin had led me into really taking a serious look at ancient cultures, but I had already, I mean, I, the other day, actually not, not too long ago, I was going through boxes in the attic, right? And I came across <laughs> these like Life and Look magazines and Saturday Evening Post magazines with articles about you know, Stonehenge and, and these ancient mounds from across the United States and in, in, in other countries and what we didn't know about them. And I'm still collecting articles on them. And these were, these were like from 1967 and 65. Mm, so I mean, wow. what was 10, 12 years old, you know, something like that. So yeah. It was saving and archiving these things right along with, you know, uh, the assassination of Robert Kennedy. It was all in the box, you know. <laughs> so uh, I think it's, it's somehow maybe I came in like uh, somehow interested in these uh, enigmas that sort of defy explanation. And, uh, and, and studying and reading the work of Robert Schock just is a further continuation of that. But I have to tell you. Where I found Robert Schock was through my study of crop circles because I was at an Electric Universe conference. Mm. I heard Robert talk. I think this was in 2011. I went out with a group of my my goddess friends. We're we're not really goddesses. We just, you know, call ourselves goddesses. We (laughs) honor each other. It's, we, we don't do any ritual. There's nothing <laughs> weird about this group. We're just really good friends. And we travel together. We go to conferences. We spend a lot of time studying with Zachariah Sitchin. And a group of us went to, out to the Electric Universe Conference to uh, learn more about plasmas. And Robert Schock was there speaking. And he talked about going to Gobekli Tepe. And he was taking his first trip there. And if anybody wanted to go... Uh, to let him know. And I passed a note to his wife and said, not only will I go, but there'll be 15 people on the trip with me. (laughs) There were 16. It was amazing. Wow. Wow. Amazing. Uh, Linda Howe was one of them as well. Uh, There were a number of very, uh, very interesting top researchers on that trip. Uh, So uh, yes, I've, I've started traveling with Robert and his wife, Katie. Um, I have so much respect for him. He's he's just such a great uh, a researcher. Uh, he knows where his firm footing is. He doesn't extrapolate to things that he can't uh, defend. He's uh, been through the ringer in terms of being attacked. Mm-hmm. And certainly, I mean, most people know he's the one who came up with the water erosion theories for the Sphinx and the encasement wall behind the Sphinx. He clearly shows that that was top-down water erosion, which means that the Sphinx would have had to have been fully dug out from that rock in, uh, structure that it was part of. It, everybody knows that was one big rock structure, and it was carved away, right. removed 
something the hind of it maybe the maybe the head and the front of that original lion maybe instead of a sphinx was was maybe a rock buttress that stuck out and then it was carved gradually over years but he clearly pointed out that there was about 10,000 years worth of water erosion on the encasement wall and on the Sphinx. Wow. So what did, what did Azalea Awas do and the Egyptologists do in reaction? They threw a fit. They were going to demand back all their artifacts from major <laughs> museums. If Jeez. the American Geological Society didn't recount its acceptance of Robert's amazing work and, and make some sort of stink about it. So, uh, the American Geological Society, after accepting Robert's proposal at, for further research, is really amazing. They backpedaled and said, "Whoa!" Oh God! A cliff. Well, of course, absolutely. But, uh, you know, if, <laughs> if, if it's true, which it's pretty obvious geologically, he proved it was true. There was water erosion there, and a good ten thousand years worth. That means that the Sphinx and the the carving of the rear end of the Sphinx from that you know, encasement enclosure there would have had to have happened at a time when that was a tropical rainforest, mm -hmm. which pushes back the dating probably, you know, I, this is my estimate, not Robert's. Robert was very conservative. He said 10,000 years, but I think it had to go back even further. Oh, I'll bet you. Uh, yeah. Because it had to water erode 10,000 years and then get covered up with sand. So it's probably more like 30, 40 or 50,000. That's what I was thinking. Wow. Yeah. We really don't know, but it really threw, throws a cold ball into our understanding of history. And that's one of the reasons he wanted to go to Gobekli Tepe. Um, and I went there with him in 2012 on this amazing trip. Um, and one of the reasons that Gobekli really fascinates Robert is because in his uh, uh, official attack that came from you know many uh, many forms, academia, um, Boston University, as well as other universities and other uh, you know experts, uh, expert geologists, they said you know if if uh, there was really you know a society. 30,000 years ago in Egypt, and if the Sphinx was really carved then, then where are the pottery shards? Where was the civilization? Why haven't we found evidence of it? And the clearest evidence of, of uh, society going back 10,000 years came right out of Gobekli Tepe. There was clear evidence there, and it wasn't Robert who did the work. It was a German scientist named Klaus Schmidt who was very strict in his procedural processes. And he clearly showed, um, and many uh, geologists and archaeologists agreed with him, that Gobekli Tepe was an amazing site that was deliberately buried over 10,000 years ago, probably mm. between 12,000 between 12, BC and 10,000 BC. It was deliberately buried. So it's it's um, it goes back much, much, much further than we originally thought that uh, man was uh, smart enough and articulate enough to raise stones, carve them, uh, put them in circles, kind of like Stonehenge, but even more complicated than Stonehenge because these are T-shaped stones right. that look like they almost balance. They stand in very, very small little grooved pits, and they were cemented into those pits using a type of limestone stone cement that we didn't think was even possible. Right. And, and then, a lot of a lot of 90 degree angles too, very yes. perfect edges, you know, and, and which is just amazing. Yeah. So traveling to Gobekli, uh, well, I'm glad I did in 2012 because uh, Turkey is not a mm. safe it was then and this is only 16 miles from the Syrian border oh, so boy. we all worry very much about the safety of these artifacts um, you know uh, a lot of um, um, different cultures, Muslim cultures, uh, many times, um, uh, extreme Muslim cultures have decided that uh, they need to change the past and, uh, you know, destroy mm, artifacts, God. Yeah. as was done by the Taliban um, uh, with ancient uh, Buddha structures that they destroyed. So we're, we're really hoping that um, uh, peace comes uh, to this section of the world and that these uh, uh these many circles. I mean, there are there are 
the amazing thing about Gobekli Tepe is only six out of maybe 20 circle, 26 circles, I think, that are underground um, uh, have been uncovered. So, or may, maybe there's 26 total, I think. And yeah, there's 26 total, I think, and only six have been uncovered. So uh, it's quite fascinating that there are more still underground and we can, we found them through, uh, uh, you know, radiosonograms and things mm -hmm. like that into the soil. So well, it's very interesting, you know, like what culture built them and what what culture buried them and how far back do they go? I mean, we right. Know well, that's that's buried. the big question. We, My we God, we know when they were buried. We can soil date samples from the soil around them to know when they were buried, but not when they were built. Now, what is your what is your feeling about um, the assistance, quote unquote, that we may have gotten from uh, ancient aliens? Well, it's a it's it's a big question. Um, do I have any facts that can say we had to have that? No. Um, there is a possibility that there could have been de-evolution and re-evolution on our planet many times, and mm -hmm. so we may have been very advanced in the past. Um, yeah, I, I I agree with you because they're they're finding things that uh, like one of the things that I was fascinated about is the that screw that screw that was embedded in the thirty three million year old rock that they yeah, found. Oh, I mean, I mean, what what, what is that? <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, did that did that fall off some sort of craft? You know, exactly. Uh, was there some crash that happened a long time ago, or yes, I mean, there's. There's many questions that remain very unanswered. Um, one of the fascinating things that Robert writes about is there may be instabilities in our sun, which cycle every 10 to 15 or 20,000 years, which make the surface of the planet uninhabitable mm. and actually burn the surface and erode the atmosphere because of major coronal mass ejections, major plasma strikes, um, and that our planet has rejuvenated potentially um, many, many times, that it, it takes a number of years for the atmosphere to come back, for plants to grow. But if we get into these, uh, one of these heightened instabilities with the sun, uh, this could probably cause all sorts of havoc on right. our on our planet. Uh, yeah. It could force people to go underground. There's a lot of evidence of people who have lived underground, certainly in, in uh, near this Gobekli Tepe region, in um, uh, Catahuliok, uh, and in another area called Cappadocia in mm -hmm. Turkey. There's evidence of people living underground, and Easter Island, and also if you look at, uh, um, you go into uh, Scotland or into um, Ireland, and you go to Newgrange. You know what? Right. What were those structures were people living in them underground? Where, you know, why, why did they bury these large stone structures? These dolomines. You know what? What are they? And and is that the only way to survive? when there's plasma instabilities or yeah. sun instabilities. So well that's one that's one way to shield from radiation is to be deep underground. Exactly. So makes sense. Exactly. Yes, and there's something about large uh, stones that might protect you that way. Right, right. Mm, interesting. Now uh I think the Mayans have, have indicated that we've had five extinctions so far and that yes. the sixth extinction is on the brink. Which uh, yeah. which I find fascinating too. Yes, their their calendar is all about a timekeeping system, uh, which is a, a combination of timekeeping. I think there what isn't there a fifty two year calendar and a and a thirteen day calendar. Right, and they had a 20, 26 or twenty nine thousand year calendar. Yes. they had all these different levels of time measurement of cycles. Right, right, and they and it was all made from observations. And and in order to create this calendar, you would have had to have lived and uh -huh. marked, I think, over one hundred twenty six thousand years <laughs> to know the cycle of all of these stars, because some of them don't actually cycle until you reach that one hundred twenty six thousand year point so yes it's it's several 5,000 year 5,296 you know year cycles that make a 126,000 year cycle I think it's it's really quite quite complicated it, it's amazing it's amazing 
I mean, just thinking about it gives me a headache, but it's just so wonderful, I mean, to consider, you know, and we're finding out about all this really, really ancient history and pulling it all together, we find out just to, just how um, in the in the big uh, the big picture, how tiny and potentially unimportant we are, you know. Yes. yes. It puts thing puts uh, puts egos into perspective very quickly. Well, it it could, <laughs> but uh, you know, and not not all of us are fascinated by these things. I mean, even if you just study the size of the Earth in relation to the other planets in our solar system, that's a mind boggling. Yes. You know, oh uh, yeah. Scenario alone, and then you start looking at the greater galaxies and the infinitesimally small insignificance of our Earth in relation to everything else. I mean, that's kind of like you know, knowledge. You're absolutely right. As as we begin to uh, you know go forward, more and more gets uncovered every day, and more and more questions get answered. You know, get get asked that we thought we had formally answered that. You know, the the former answers no longer make sense. Right. Right light of the new data so yeah as as lee spiegel says in in the travis film you have to follow the evidence you know a right. good researcher looks at the facts whether it gives you information you don't like you gotta stick with the with the facts and you'll always stay true to your story if you stick with the facts even if they don't make sense yeah it's 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 the you know you got to stay like they say in uh, politics follow the money when well, science right exactly follow the evidence right Right, right. So um, I'd love to tell you a little bit about Malta. Please, please, yes. Um, There are many ancient sites in Malta that sort of, they're not exactly resembling Gobekli Tepe or Stonehenge, but they sort of do. There are these series of uh, what they consider to be prehistoric temples. Uh, There's a whole long list of them that are in a language that sounds like it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, Arabic and actually part of the natural language mm. in Malta is a combination of an Arabic language mixed with other languages. It's really quite, quite unique, but most everybody there speaks English. But anyway, we went looking specifically at a lot of these um, ancient enclosures. Sometimes there were four or five or six kind of all together. Uh, that looked like a series of circles. If anyone has looked at some of uh, Michael Tellinger's work, he's taken pictures of a lot of stone circles uh, and made them quite public on the on the internet. Um, some of the Dolomines look like that from the air, where there could be five or six or seven rooms that kind of all have backs that that connect, but they're mm. separate separate little structures and they have very interesting shapes to some of the stones or some of the openings that if anyone's been to Peru they see a typical doorway which is narrower at the top and wider at the bottom Mm. it's um it's kind of like an a shape a little bit you know with a square top and you see this again and again also in Malta And you see an awful lot of um, sophisticated, uh, um, what's the right word to use? They they, they carved the stones in precise ways to enable them to fit or niche together so that they wouldn't move in earthquake. Uh, Mm. Sometimes this was curved uh you know blocks that turned a corner that were curved to niche and fit together overlapping each other or sometimes like you can see in stonehenge you'll have an upright stone that has a point on the top of it right like a carved point and then another stone that fits across the top that fits into that point so that they literally notch together like a nail or a spike you know going through an opening um, and of course, these are 16 and 20 ton stones. No, God. Um, they're not as precisely carved as you see in certain areas, uh, like you find in, in Peru. Um, but they're mostly rough hewn stones, but very closely fitted together. So it's like imagine Stonehenge without any spaces between the stones. So they're circular structures, sometimes with roofs. 
Um, sometimes they're partially buried underground, sometimes above ground. But there were so many of them all over Malta that uh, they've become a uh, you know national treasures and national archives for for their country. And many stone clay figurines have been dug up, and some that are quite large. What we often refer to as the 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 fat goddess. Right or the pregnant goddess or the, the large figured woman. Many, many, many uh, sculptures have come out along with pottery and uh, you know very in, very intricately carved pottery. Mm -hmm. Lots of stone spirals. So there was something going on that leads you to believe that in these openings, these doorway openings into these dolomines or these structures. They often faced the equinox, mm. where the sun rose. You know, when the when this when the when there was an equal day and night. That's the equinox, or on the solstice, where the sun appears to stand still. That's what solstice means. It means sun standing still. So we were there, of course, on March twenty uh, first, which was one of the. Um, Ah, one of the equinoxes. And the sun, of course, comes right in one of these doorways and lights up one of these caverns in the back. Mm, wow. It has a spiral on it. And, of course, we went there at, you know, 4.30 in the morning so we could see the first light of day come up over the hill and hit the back of the stone. But what culture was building things that understood sun cycles? It, it's just humbling when you're there and you see this type of phenomenon happen you know that they were watching the sun so of course what we were talking about earlier is sun instability plasma strikes right why were they watching the sun yeah they yeah worried about the stability of the sun were they aware that instabilities could happen um or were they harnessing sun energy in some way? Uh, we really, really don't know. Right. They must have known more than we give them credit for in terms they of, you know, must, the sun. Yeah. They must have. Now, not only that, but we had a couple of, like, stunning moments. Uh, I was standing with Robert and Katie, and we were at uh, a tempo called Ha. I'll, I'll spell it H A R, I'm sorry, H A G A R, Hagar, and then Quim, Q I M. So we're hmm. standing at this at this amazing structure on the coast, and we are in the threshold going into this uh, ancient circular structure. And Robert looks down, and the threshold stone that he's standing on has what looks like it a vitrified glass uh, river that's maybe three, four inches wide and an irregular shape running through it from one wow. side to the other. And he like moves his feet and looks down and it takes his breath away. And Katie looks down and says, oh my God, oh my God, it's just a cry. <laughs> So the people that built this structure took a stone slab that had been hit by a plasma strike that vitrified the stone to glass. Right. Oh, man. And that was the threshold stone of this. That is amazing. Temple. So you tell me these ancients weren't watching what was going on for their own survival. I think they were. Oh, it not, no kidding. Yeah, it really sounds like it. Doesn't it? You know, now, now, you yeah, I mean, some people will say, oh, well, that was an alien race that came here and they were trying to teach us about the instabilities of the sun. Well, maybe, you know, yeah, we don't yeah, know. All well and good, but, you know. Somebody, somebody knew something and somebody yeah. was trying to talk to future generations before there was language, before there was, you know, a written way. So there are pictorial references to movement of the sun. Um, but you, you know, it's it's all in a language of of evidence of sun energy on the surface of the earth. Yeah, uh, you know, another site 
that really fascinates me is Puma Punku. Uh, yes. With those uh, unbelievable, it, it, they say on on uh, Ancient Aliens that it looks like it was exploded. You know, yes. it was subject of, of some sort of an explosion that destroyed everything. But when you look at the 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 structure of the stones there, the the right angles, the the H shapes, and uh, an obvious interlocking system for walls, uh, just just really blows me away. Yes, I I um, have been there only once, and I went there with Robert and Katie, actually, a number of years ago in 2012. I was hoping you were. That's great. <laughs> yes, I and uh, the, the stone is very, very, very hard stone. Most of those stones in Pumapuka are andesite. So it's a very hard stone. It's not like a volcanic rock or a limestone, which is very easy to carve. Right. Like the stones at Gobekli Tepe are mostly limestone, and they're right from the rock outcropping that they're on top of. So like, they didn't have to take the stone far, but still it was a sophisticated process to get large stones out in one piece and carve them with very fine, thin edges. It was still a matter of uh, uh, fine articulation. But in Pumapuka, it's a whole different magnitude of being able to cut very, very hard stone. In some cases, the only way you can cut stone that hard is in some cases with a diamond yeah. or a laser. So, you know. And that's what it looks like. I mean, that really, I mean, the sharpness of the edges, it looks like a laser, and, yes. and which baffling. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of... Um, I don't even know how to describe these drill holes that are so small, you can't even put a pencil in them or a straw. It's got to be like a cocktail straw <laughs> for Amazing. a teeny that can fit in these tiny drill holes. And they all go in precisely the same amount. Like I had some copper dowsing rods with me that I traveled with that were quite small. And I, ha I have pictures of this. Like I was sticking them in the holes and I marked it with my finger how deep it went in. And I went all the way down this one very complicated, you know, andesite stone, which had all sorts of interesting carvings. But there was this row of drilled holes that were all about, Mm, I'm going to say maybe an inch and to an inch and a half deep, all on a straight line, right down the side. And then, you know, in some cases, there were drill holes that went through the stone and then curved and turned like larger holes, almost as if it was a handle of some sort or a rope went through it, or it was a hooking mechanism where it hooked in with another stone. And then there were these areas where you see two stones next to each other, and there's an H cut between the two of them, as if you could pour in molten iron and it would create like a staple holding those stones together so they wouldn't move an earthquake. Oh, interesting, it, yeah. In many cases, uh, some metals were found in them, and it was very confusing. How did the ancient culture, before they knew about iron smelting and things like that, how did they, how did they know they could melt iron and pour it into these stones? Well, they must have had some skill at doing that. Yeah. As we found the evidence. Now, most of those iron staples were dug out and those that iron was melted down and used into swords and other things like that, probably by Cortez and uh, and uh, other people who conquered, you know, the Spaniards who were conquering uh, most of South America and taking out the metals. But it's uh, it's when you go to Pumapuca, you really realize that some major catastrophe happened there. Yeah. I you, you, you can see how the uh, Peruvian and the Bolivian governments are trying to uncover some of these stones, pull them out of the mud, and literally they're just in there as if a huge mudslide or landslide took place. And, and Pumapuca is not far from Lake Titicaca. Right. Now, what's fascinating to me is that the nearest city is La Paz, and La Paz is one of the highest cities in the world. It's over 14,000 feet. So when you go there, uh, you really need oxygen. Like it's, you, you get headaches, you get altitude sickness. I don't care who you are. Certainly if you're 50 and above, mm -hmm. you're going to have some, some <laughs> physical issues. And and even I I did too. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty 
pretty fit physically, but uh, I was taking oxygen at night. I wasn't drinking alcohol. I was drinking lots of water. You, know, <laughs> you, you have to be careful. But I think that um, it's, it's quite clear that Lake Titicaca has, and, and you can find seahorses and other things in that, uh, the biology of that lake that let you know it was once probably a, um, a sea. It was open to uh, a freshwater sea of some sort. Um, and maybe the Amazon or maybe, you know, there, there must have been some major earthquake, I suspect, that um, hit Pumapuka and possibly closed up that sea that might have been originally open to the Atlantic or, yeah, maybe, yeah. or maybe to the Pacific. But I suspect it was a long waterway to the Atlantic or the Gulf. And it closed up and that mountain raised up very, very high. Maybe when other part maybe when the ice shelves melted or maybe when atlantis sunk or lemuria sunk you know we don't really know yeah but i think puma puka goes back much 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 further in our history yeah yeah you know, yeah and the, the earth is very dynamic too so changes are always taking place and, and, yeah and we we're aware of it i mean california earthquakes or you know the world is i don't know i think there was what uh couple of thousand earthquakes every day around the world. Yes, yes. And and we know that the coast has relatively been the same, certainly since the Piri Reis map, mm -hmm. which I think was, well, the, the Piri Mies, I'm sorry, I'm mispronouncing it, the, the Piri Mies map <laughs> Was, That's tough. Yeah, <laughs> was, uh, was spoken about, I think, by Plato, and and it was known to be. I think it's there is still a copy of it somewhere. I thought it was in an Istanbul museum, but I couldn't find it when I was there. But um, it it goes back before the 1520s, so it's a map of the south coast. I, mean, I should say the east coast of South America, all the way down to Cape Horn. And it is relatively very much the same as it is today. So uh, we know something happened there, but we don't know what. Well, well the Piri Reis map in and of itself, how did people way, way back then get such an accurate view of the coastline from the air? You wonder. Yes, so they had to have math. They had to have math building skills. They were probably ancient mariners a long time ago. Um, you know, if if you can build a reed raft uh, and you can get on a coastal current, the coastal currents are sort of like the conveyor belts. You know, if you get out there, you're going to travel around the coastline. Oh yeah. And so uh, somebody mapped it, and they had very accurate skills. I mean, that, that's another thing that comes up when even you look at some of these ancient sites like, like Gobekli Tepe. Whoever built it had to have some form of mathematics. Absolutely. They had to have some, and Robert thinks that they were probably building them as monuments to the stars because they kind of line up with Taurus. And there is some carvings on them that make you think that, well, maybe they're facing the constellation Taurus or or. Uh, um, Oh, uh, Orion, he's not really quite sure, but uh, they would have been on the equinoxes at you know certain periods of time in history. You can turn the clock back and you can see what the night sky looked like. We know how right. to do this with our computer programs now, but that's all math. So they must have had some form of measuring in mathematics, and the same is true with ma with maps. Oh, yeah. M-A-P-S. We're not talking M-A-T-H. It's M-A-P-S. So <laughs> you need a form of survey, of distance, of calculation, of, uh, you know, travel time, uh, how long it takes to get from here to there, 24 hours in a day, you know, calculations, how the sun and shadow lights fall and what the distance is between this cove and the next and how many miles or how many feet. Right, so it, right. it all comes down to being able to calculate your observations with some sort of tool of measurement, and that's mathematics. 
Now, th- there's another there's another site, and I'm trying to remember where it is. Where you know it, it the the walls look as if the stones were mold- molded. I think it's Cusco. Yes. Well, you're you're yeah, talking the walls. about what's called Saxawama, and it's right in the city of Cusco. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it, it's a series of three layers of wall stacked upon one another, each recessed a slight bit and each a slight bit smaller than the than the predecessor below it. And they are triangular walls in that it's a zigzag that goes mm-hmm. in and in and out and in and out and in and out. And it goes on for, I don't know, 1,500 feet or something. It's absolutely amazing. But yes, I mean, the stones are the size of semis. Right. And you Large. can't get a dollar bill between them. I mean, you just, That's they're just incredible. You can't even put a, a pin through them or a credit card or anything like that. And many of them are so faceted together with upwards of 26, 27, 29 little nooks, curves, and crannies that the other stones around them fit into. So it almost looks like they were somehow molten when they were. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Somehow, so I think Giorgio on one of the shows said that uh, they were they were somehow molded or softening them somehow. I don't know. Just incredible. It it is really quite amazing. You know, when you not- think of when you think about the fact that that builders today can't even do this with with the accuracy that they had used back then, which you know that just blows your mind. Yes, and there's there's a number of sites in, in Peru. I, if anyone's listening and they're looking for some really good trips, I can highly recommend uh, Peru. I know they've recently had uh, a lot of uh, severe flooding, uh, certainly in, in the Lima uh, area, which is where you'd have to fly through to get to an area of Cusco. But um, as far as I know, the airport is fine. But I, I really recommend traveling in, in South America with, with a group. I wouldn't recommend going alone. Certainly, oh, you know, yeah. young women going alone. Oh, but, yeah. I would never do but, it alone. But going with a group, Peru is a, is a really good uh, good bargain. There's uh, their, their dollar, called the Sole, um, is uh, rated at about three to one American dollar. So your money goes three times as far. And uh, things are not that expensive. And there's amazing sights to see there. Um, Cusco and the what's called the Orobamba Valley it follows the Orobamba River from uh, from the Cusco area. You're actually going north and you're going south. Mm. In, well, not north. I mean, I should say you're going... <clears throat> north in the country but you're going uh lower in elevation into the amazon so when you when you get to uh uh what's known as machu picchu you're actually in lower elevation than you are when you're in cusco Uh, but it's an amazing valley with some fabulous sites all along that river another amazing one a lot of people don't know about or go to is called oleante tambo uh and this has huge terraced plateaus that you have to climb before you get to the top of this rock uh, structure where there are amazing, perfectly smooth, large stones the size of semis that also fit together. And you're, you're just stunned because this is the earlier culture. We know that the, uh, the, um, uh, not the Mayans, the Incas. We know that the Incas built with small stones you can hold in your fist, and they used mud mortar to put them together, and they did accurate building, mimicking the earlier structures that were built with huge megalithic stones. But they didn't know how to build the way the earlier culture did, what they call the pre-Columbian culture. Right, right. Don't know how far back that goes. Mm. So I was going to just mention, you know, I, I don't um, – uh, confess to be a psychic, uh, nor would I ever sell my services in that way, but I am a pretty good dowser. <laughs> I have dows to find, um, you know, water pipes in my yard and yeah. an electric my, my, my grandfather, my grandfather was, he, 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 he found wells that way for people. 
so so I did, you know, I was walking around only on Tetambo and also Pumapuka, and I started dowsing, and I started asking questions, looking for a yes or a no answer, because that's the way dowsing works. Either you say, you know, show me the water line or something, and, and you wait for your rods to move, or you ask a question, and you're looking for yes or no. So I started going back in time going, okay, was this, you know, 5,000 years ago? Was this 10,000 years ago? Was this 15,000 years ago? At Pumapuka, I got 55,000 years ago. Wow, that's incredible. And I got the same thing at Oliente Tambo. I got a similar date at Easter Island. Um, I got some similar dates at some other sites we were at in Turkey as well. Um, not, not Gobekli. I don't think I was dowsing. I don't think I asked the question at Gobekli, but, um, you know, wh wherever I come across these very unusual stone walls, like you were talking about, you have, remember seeing pictures of it, Saksawama, you, you can see walls similarly built on Easter Island. They're not as big, but you look at them and you go, oh my gosh, it's the same architects. Yeah. Yeah. Who built these, you know? <laughs> so I started dowsing wherever I saw these unusual stone structures. And um, I got 55,000. Now, th there's some one other interesting thing I'll share if we have another five minutes. I know we're starting to run out of time. We, we have as much time as you need. Okay. Well, one of the wonderful things about traveling with Robert Chuck is that he he knows his stone, right? So many of the Moai structures on Easter Island are carved out of a volcanic rock, but there are some that are not. There are some that are carved out of what, what he refers to as andesite or like a dolomite type stone, which is a much harder stone. It's more like a granite, but there are no granite quarries on Easter Island. Mm. Yeah. So where did the granite moai come from? Now, a number of the granite moai were scarfed up and hauled away to museums like the Louvre and the Metropolitan Museum in New York and the Pergamon. I mean, all the top museums that were in Assyria, right, or were in, uh, you know, um, the Middle East in the 1920s. They were also in. Are still a few on the island. The only place you can find any kind of uh, granite quarry or, you know, very hard stone andesite quarry is off the coast under 30 feet of water. Mm, yeah. And Jacques Cousteau was the one that found those. So, so Robert is telling us this story, right? And we're standing there looking at one of these granite moai, and I'm thinking, well, who the hell was diving 30 feet of water and carving up <laughs> water? And he says, yes, exactly. He said, it poses a big question. Really? Possibly the culture who was first building the moai were doing it over 30,000 years ago when the sea levels were lower. Right. That yeah. One of the earlier ice ages, right? The ice was thicker on the on the North Pole and the South Pole. The seas were lower. So it's really quite fascinating. Um, one of those other curveballs that just gets thrown out there. And, you know, uh, not too many people write about that. You know, uh, and, and the Moai, what are they looking at? <laughs> they're exactly, all, exactly. They're all looking up. I can tell you, <laughs> I've been there. And they're looking up in a very interesting part of the sky. It's the part of the sky that Zachariah Sitchin said, you got to be looking here in the Southern Hemisphere because there is a rogue planet in our solar system that's on uh -huh. a typical orbit. It's on an elliptical orbit, and it's going to create havoc. Emmanuel Velikovsky wrote about this as well in World yep. of Vision. Yep. So, you know, this is kind of a nice tie-up for us, ending in the South Pacific at Easter Island. <laughs> To everything we've talked about, you know, we're talking about ancient sites and crop circles and uh, hidden history. And so uh, those Moai are all looking at something. Yeah, yeah, I, I, that, that's pretty fascinating. Yeah. 
It's like it's like they're standing there with their gaping mouths, looking up, going, "Well, like, uh oh, yeah, shit, uh oh, here they're it comes." They're waiting for the spaceships to come back. <laughs> right. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, yeah, waiting for their ride out of there, right before the sun burns them up. Well, it's really it's really just amazing how uh, how diverse we are starting to understand our world is and how complicated, complex, and amazing the history is and history just doesn't go for you know a couple of hundred or a couple of thousand years we're talking millions and millions of years back in the past uh just incredible just incredible i personally think that uh planet earth has has been i guess cleaned off and remade again by you know the sun and universal forces over and over several times, as has planets like Mars, uh, which obviously have been, you know, uh, inhabited in the past. I and mean, they're just finding too much out about it. Uh, there's water there. Uh, there's erosion. And, uh, of course, they're finding some really weird looking sculptures, too. So interesting stuff. Yes, yes. It's just been stripped of his atmosphere, unfortunately. Yes, exactly. And uh, I don't know, I was reading today where uh, Stephen Hawking says that he made a mistake in his estimation that humanity has a thousand years left. And it's more like a hundred that we better start finding the our alternative Earth, because uh, that's about all the time we're going to have is a hundred years. Wow. I don't know. <laughs> yes, it is. We're all going to ascend. <laughs> oh, yeah. NASA's planning a manned mission to Mars, and uh, I think it's in 2032, or is what where our projection is. So we are, we are at the point in our evolution where we're thinking of going off planet, yeah, uh, it, with a with a manned mission. So why couldn't have that happened in the ancient past? I mean, oh, I believe I'm right there with you. I'm yeah. right there with you. Yeah, we you know, the, the way we think now is not a whole lot different, I suppose, than cultures thought in the past. Yes, uh, yeah, may, may, maybe. Um, uh, we tend to think also we are responsible for maybe destruction of the planet. But there, mm. uh, as you read more about the electric universe, you begin to realize that all the other planets in our solar system are also showing signs of heating up. Yes. And it may be something that's going on within our whole uh, solar system, maybe even within our whole galaxy. Um, and that we may not be, you know, um, we, we may be aiding the process along with our fossil fuels and, you know, our destruction of the ozone and, you know, uh, other things that we're doing. But uh, there may be evidence that there's another uh, uh, process afloat, which we've not really fully understood. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So, you know, um, climate change, real or not, it's going to happen because it always has and always will on a cyclical basis. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, we have really covered uh, not only the Earth, but even part of the universe uh, – <laughs> Our solar system and everything else tonight. It, it really, I mean, just an amazing night for information. And I'm, I'm sure our audiences are sitting there with mouths agape and all of the information that uh, that you're you're sharing with us. I I envy your ability to go visit these places. It's just incredible the stuff that you learn just by being there. Well, and, it, um, it helps. It helps. I'll tell you, I do a lot of reading as well. Um, yeah. And I, I really, I learn a lot by going to conferences. So I kind of pick and choose uh, what what fits with my, you know, with the gaps in my knowledge and what do I really need to, to learn. But there's so much I'd like to learn. Like one of the things we didn't even talk about, which is all over Malta, is cart ruts. Um, for oh, those, right. I mean, C A R T car. Yeah, track. yeah. Like or like track. reverse railroad tracks. Yeah, like yeah. what the heck are these? <laughs> and they they seem to be carved it carved or created. Oh, oh, we just don't know by what. They look like, you know, uh train tracks or something, just but in, in reverse carved <laughs> right. in. Right. Oh, so, I saw them, yeah. Oh yeah. and they go right out into the sea. 
Like they just go right off the coast and right out into the sea. And then, you know, uh, scuba divers say, oh, yeah, yeah, they continue to go, you know, on under the ocean. We we found them. So and, and some people have even said even into, you know, northern uh, Libya and into Morocco and places like that, they they like they find them there. Like they come right out of the sea. Wow. <laughs> and I'm like, Jeez. Oh, what is that about? Mm. <laughs> No. They had trains from Malta to Libya. Ancient, yeah, ancient undersea years travel. Ago. They might <laughs> no, have like what? Yeah, we we just don't know. It's there's a big question, and of course we also don't know, um, you know, about the whole Mediterranean. Was that originally a landmass that was higher? Was the what they call the the gates of Gibraltar right there where Spain meets North Africa? Was that originally a solid landmass? Mm, right. And when that broke apart in an earthquake, was the the flood everybody talks about was that the creation of the Mediterranean? Did that landmass sink? There's a lot of evidence that yes, it probably did. You know, uh, there was a probably a massive flood that went all the way up to the Caspian Sea, you know, went, you know, uh, all the way to the Black Sea and then and then recessed back. Uh, it's really quite fascinating. Um, yeah. You know, they, they they found a whole sunken city off the coast of Alexandria, you know, in, in Egypt. So that was that was recent, right? Yes. Very, yeah. very recently. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, like I said, it just there's more that comes to life every day. It, yeah. it makes you want, it makes you want to live another, you know, 40, 50, 60 years, another lifetime into the future. It's just to just to figure out what what else are we going to learn? Yeah, that's why I'm hoping uh, when when I get up to heaven, there's this little machine. You know, do you do you want to go back and live another life? Yes, yes, yes. Let's go back. Well, I, I think I just want to be able to peer through. Well, that would be nice yeah, too. I yeah, just come back. watch from a distance. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Be some sort of a, a ethereal influence. Right. Right. Well, listen. Do you want to? Take a few minutes and and kind of I, I know you talked about open minds and a couple of other things, but did you miss anything in terms of uh, where you're going to be or what you're going to be doing or where people can, you know, see the Travis film in the future? Well, um, you know, if somebody tuned in late, they might want to check out the Pine Bush UFO Fair that's going to be happening the weekend of uh, May uh, 24. For, uh, May 19th and 20th in Pine Bush. If they're anywhere near Ithaca on Sunday the 21st, we're going to have a screening of the Travis film over there. Um, and if they live in the Philadelphia area, Travis is going to be at Mainline MUFON, and they can go to MainlineMUFON.com to uh, learn about uh, how to meet and hear Travis present his uh, new perspective on his abduction, which happened over 42 years ago now. This uh, this November 5th, I think, will be the 42nd year anniversary mm, yeah. of that event. Um, and if they want to learn more about the documentary that I worked on um, called TravisWaltonTheMovie.com, they can go to... Uh, I'm sorry, called the movie's called Travis Walton, uh, or Travis, the true story of Travis Walton. And uh, the best film site for that is TravisWaltonTheMovie.com. And they can, you know, see a synopsis of the film. They can see some of the raw archives uh, of some of the original interviews we did. Some we used and some we didn't and parts that we didn't use uh, that I just posted online. There's a great interview we did with George Knapp, which I so wish we could have done. Oh, wow. And had right in the film, but uh, Peter and I had to resort to doing it on Skype, and the sound was just not good enough for me to put mm. in the film because, you know, our powerful George Knapp sounded like a little mouse coming out of my computer, <laughs> and I just wasn't going to do that to him. You know, um, I unfortunately didn't uh, plug into the computer and go right into my my Zoom mic, which I probably should have done. But um, we were struggling on a tight time frame to to catch the interview with him because we missed him live in Philadelphia. So um, 
so there's a lot of good stuff posted there at uh, TravisWaltonTheMovie.com. And if people think it's a good film, we were talking about this earlier. Right. Uh, I'd love it if they want to write me and tell me or uh, if they send the YouTube uh uh, trailer to their friends and in emails, it helps boost the numbers up and gets a network or possibly a distributor interested in carrying this film and helping to further the understanding of this this UFO issue and how it affects humanity. Um, the the films won twenty seven film festival acknowledgments and awards. Oh, that's amazing! Wow. In, in mainstream festivals, as as we were speaking about before, and and it's been. Uh, uh, unsuccessfully uh, posted to YouTube, but it's been posted to YouTube over 60 times and I've had to take it down. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, it's a sign that the people think it's good and they want to share it and they want to get it out. So I'm, I'm very honored by that. But at the same time, if I want to try to, to sell it, just to literally put money back in my retirement account, that's what I have to do. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm really hoping that a distributor picks it up. So if there's anybody in the film industry listening or anybody hey, else, right. and, film industry uh you know call your friends tell them uh it's it's a good film and it's available for sale and um uh it will only also help travis and other abductees get their story better well known absolutely uh, if it gets out there so uh, i think that's that's the goal of our radio show too yeah yeah, and it's such a pleasure to be with both of you, with, with Julia and, and Mike, and and also uh, with Bill Forte up in New York. Oh yeah, honor. I Thank really. You. I think it's a we. Pleasure I think to we, have you. We have a jewel in Bill Forte here, Bill Skywatcher. Thank Just you. a good guy. You still there? You still there? Yeah, I'm here. I was enjoying listening to all of you, and I really am looking forward to seeing Jennifer in a couple of weeks. She's wonderful. Oh, we didn't I will have to there. ask any questions. She just told. Yeah, yeah, you're so knowledgeable. You just went through. I I didn't have any questions for you. Oh, that, I, that's I'm a first. Sorry, I get <laughs> no. so excited. I, I feel bad because I felt like I dominated the conversation, but there, no, you know, just, just so, so much that I'm interested in, and you know, tapping into Jennifer's uh head full of knowledge just is uh, just a great opportunity we're going to have you back at some point yeah, if you, there's just you have so to. much information well i'd love it i i consider it a head full of questions <laughs> 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 you know it's like i don't really know any of the answers you know but you know boy do i know what the questions are <laughs> <laughs> right well, thanks. absolutely thanks again jennifer for taking thank the time you. to spend thank time you. with this and uh, on that note, I think we're just about there. Uh, I want to say good night to everybody across the USA, around the world, and uh, out there in the multiverse and the ether. Uh, have a very good week. God bless. And uh, we'll see you next week. We're going to have Debbie Solaris, right, other right. known now, as Debbie, Debbie Polelli. Polelli, right? Debbie yeah, Polelli. she is a psychic. She, I did good. a reading with her. It was fabulous. I found out my, my star origins. And she's going to talk about all the different races that she knows and she talks to. It's That's right. Uh, Julia is going to be in the pilot seat next week. And uh, yeah. tune in and listen to this fascinating lady. Both fascinating ladies, Julia, too. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Good, Good night, night everybody. everybody.